You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Griot and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about Black history, past and present. So here's how this works. We have five rounds of questions about us, Black history, the entire diaspora, current events, you name it. And with each round, the questions get a little tougher, and the guest has 10 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they'll receive one symbolic Black fist, and they'll hear this. And if they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we still love them anyway. And after five questions, there'll be a Black bonus round at the end just for fun. Our guest for this episode is Ernie Hudson. Ernest Lee Hudson is an American actor and voice actor. He's most known for his roles as Winston Zeddemore in the Ghostbusters film series, Warden Leo Glynn on HBO's Oz, and Sergeant Albrecht in The Crow. He's been in numerous films, most notably are the Ghostbusters series, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, The Crow, and its sequel, The Crow's Stairway to Heaven, Miss Congeniality, and its sequel, Miss Congeniality 2, and You're Not You. And he's also appeared in in several Hallmark movies. Oh, Mr. Hudson, thank you so much for joining The Blackest Questions. Well, thank you. I'm so um, happy to be here with you, I think. <laughs> It's all in good fun. I promise you the Grio is just going to treat you right. So I've been told that you're from Benton Harbor, Michigan. Yes. And you grew up writing short stories and poems, and you dreamt of being on stage. Where did that come? Are you from an artsy family? No, no. I never knew anyone even remotely in the business when I was growing up. Um, But, you know, you watch television, you see movies, you know, you fantasize. Um, never really thinking it was a reality that was mm-hmm. possible. But, um, you know, as life goes on, you get introduced to more and, and suddenly that those possibilities adjust and change. Okay. Are you ready for question number one? Yes, let's have it. This photographer, composer, author, poet, and film director is quoted for saying the camera is used as a weapon against poverty and racism. Who was he? Wow. Oh, um... Uh, Gordon Parks? Yes, you are correct. It's Gordon Parks, one of the most groundbreaking figures in 20th century photographer. His photojournalism during the 1940s to the 1970s reveals important aspects of American culture, and he became known for focusing on issues of civil rights, poverty, race relations, and urban life. And one of his most famous photographs shows a family gathered around a segregated water fountain in Mobile, Alabama in 1956. So Mm. Parks' pictures show the struggle of Black Americans to gain equal rights during the Civil Rights Movement, as well as depictions of poverty and racism across the entire country. So when you're working with Gordon Parks, what what were some of the lessons learned from the set? Was that your first big set that you had worked on? Yeah, I'd done some small things in Detroit, but that was mm-hmm. the first. It was a major studio movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember I had a very, very um, difficult dance. It was a, a challenge. Roger Mosley was playing guitar and I was dancing. We were competing for the same girl. And I got tired and I just, I just, uh, I stopped and said, cut. And he went off. <laughs> and he told me, you never say cut, you know. I'm. The you don't get to say cut. <laughs> I yeah, I say cut, and um, since then I've never said cut again. I you know I just kind of fight through it and do what I got to do. But mm-hmm. um, but he was just really he was just just he was a just a wonderful man. I knew him up until he transitioned. Mm-hmm. He always called me the character's name, which is Archie. So I was always Archie. But I love that. Um, but yeah. I, <laughs> I just always remember him just could not believe that I said cut and stop. (laughs) Uh, I met Gordon's daughter um, and left a a photo and resume at her house almost by accident on her piano, not knowing that that night Gordon Parks was going to come to dinner and he saw my photo and resume and he was doing Lead Belly, which was his second movie. He did The Learning Tree was his first movie. And... um, and he, um, um, the studio gave me a call, and it sort of came out of um, a lot of frustration, a lot of trying hard, a lot of trying to make something happen. And just at that point when it seemed impossible, I get a call from um, 
from the studio, Paramount Studio, saying Gordon Parks wanted to see me. Mm. I didn't wow. even know it was his daughter that when I, um, I, I didn't know she was related to him, but that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break and come back with Mr. Ernie Hudson playing the Blackest Question. Okay, we are back. We're playing the Blackest Questions with Mr. Ernie Hudson. Are you ready for question number two? Okay, let's have it. Okay. You're doing very well, by the way. <laughs> that's one <laughs> question. <laughs> We're one for one. Hey, listen, that's better than some. <laughs> so which Black Panther, Wakanda Forever stars, are all Yale Drama School alumni? Oh, um, um, Angela Bassett mm -hmm. is. And uh, who else was... Uh, no. Um, oh, 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 oh. Um, what's her name? Um, um, an African um, mm -hmm. uh, actress. Um, but um, I, 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 I just can't think of her okay. name. Okay. So, it's but three. So it's Angela three? Bassett. It's Lupita Nyongo. And another and that, that is um, Denai. Um, did she go to Yale? No, she, she didn't. didn't. The third oh. also starred in Modern Family, not at the same time as you, but Winston Duke. Oh, really? Yes. So Angela oh. Bassett made history at the 2023 Golden Globes uh, in Los Angeles when she won for Best Supporting Actress in Black Panther Wakanda Forever, becoming the first performer to win a Globe in an acting category for their role in a Marvel film. In 2014, Lupita Nyong'o became the first Black actress to land a Lancome contract. It okay. was also named People Magazine's Most Beautiful. And her character, Nakia, revealed to have a son with uh, the Black Panther in Wakanda Forever. Uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Wakanda yeah. Forever. And then Winston Duke is a Tabagonian actor. He made his feature film debut in the role of M'Baku in Black Panther and is best known for portraying the character in four films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So there's there's quite a bit of Yale Drama School um, uh, represented in Black Panther. So you, you're you one of the handful of actors in Hollywood to receive a full scholarship to the MFA program at the prestigious Yale Drama School. How did that come about? Uh, did someone see you? Did you go out and audition? Was Yale on your radar at all? How does that... How did that work? Well, when I graduated from Wayne State in Detroit, um, mm -hmm. I got a scholarship to uh, the University of Iowa. Um, and I was really, um, and then I saw a Ronald Reagan movie where he had a Yale sweater on. Oh. And I thought, Yale, that would be kind of cool. So, <laughs> so I applied late and uh, and was told to wait another year when, you know, I mm -hmm. missed the deadline. And then uh, I ended up driving to Yale and, and asked to meet with uh, the dean of admissions. Uh, I had an interview with him and um, convinced him that I really needed to go now. Uh, I was in the playwriting program. I wasn't in the acting program. Okay. Uh, and, um, and that's kind of one of those things that um, life unfolds in a way that I couldn't have planned that. Right. Um, so by the time I left the meeting and drove from New Haven to Detroit, uh, when I walked into my apartment, the phone was ringing and it was Yale saying that I had been accepted. <laughs> so you just hop back in the car and, and turn, back, turn back around. Well, well eventually, <laughs> my, my ex-wife was heading to Minnesota to work on a PhD. But um, yeah, it was Yale was probably not the best fit for me. Not probably. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the best fit for me. Um, uh, you know, I didn't finish a program. I never really, it was, it, Yale was a different time. By the time mm -hmm. Angela Bassett, uh, uh, came along, the program had changed a lot, but, um, I never really felt, um, it was the best thing. It's certainly not the best thing for my writing. I know okay. that probably sounds whatever, but. No, I mean, not every school's a great fit as an academic. I definitely know that, uh, yeah. for sure. Okay. And also so I think, you know, when I was at Yale, I was. You know, I had already graduated college. I'd been working a lot, and I thought I knew probably more than I did. <laughs> so I was not really receptive to, you know. Uh huh. Yes, the you know. the larger critiques of life that one has yes. to grow into. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan's sweater should not have been the biggest motivation <laughs> for going to Yale. Yes, for our listeners at the <laughs> out there, we we aren't going to take career advice from Ronald Reagan 
it's his sweaters or anything else with that man. All right, yeah. we're we're gonna take a quick break and come back with Mr. Ernie Hudson playing the blackest question. I am back. We're playing the blackest questions. I'm with Mr. Ernie Hudson. We're doing all right. We're about one and a half out of two. Um, are you ready for question number three? Yes. Okay. This person was a revolutionary for civil rights in the 1970s and 1980s and used his music as a form of political activism. His 1970 and 1971 albums unintentionally anointed him the first rapper title. Who is he? Wow, the first rapper title? Mm -hmm. um, his albums from 1970 and 1971. Jeez, I, I have no idea. Uh, Okay, so the answer is Gil Scott Heron. Oh, wow. Oh, geez, of course, yeah. Gil Scott Heron was a poet who underscored his words with music, and few artists have been more influential to the music industry than Gil Scott yeah. Heron. His 1970 album, Small Talk, preceded rap by nearly a decade and paved the way for modern artists like Kanye West and Kendrick Lamar and so many others. And when Pieces of a Man was recorded in 1971, Enriched with 14 consciously potent and luscious tracks, this could have been recognized as just a very good soul album, but when tracing down the lineage of lyrical music and the birth of hip-hop, many students of the genre trace it back to this album from 1971. Yeah. So we know that in, you know you wrote short stories, you were a playwright and poems. Uh, did you ever listen to Gil Scott Heron? Was he part of your, I, I guess, vinyl collection? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was... Um... I, you know, it's funny because you said rap. I, I didn't think of him. I always thought of him as a poet. But yeah, he would have. You know, he would have been the, you know, the the beginning of that. He was doing. He was amazing. He was doing things and and saying things that, uh, um, you know, nobody else was doing in the same way. So I, I, yeah, he was very, very, very influential, especially at that time in college because you know I think we were all, sort of, um, it was kind of the begin, not the beginning, but we we're all trying to immerse ourselves in the whole black power experience, embracing, you know, what we thought of as ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but Gil Scott was very, very, um, he was it's just an amazing talent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now thinking back from your days when you wrote, uh, especially when you were an undergrad. As a professor, I'm always curious, do you have a particular class that you remember fondly um, that, that you feel is, is part of the foundation of who you are today? Yeah, there was um, uh, a professor at uh, Wayne State. His name was uh, Earl D.A. Smith. Mm -hmm. um, Earl set up a, a Black students organization. He ran the, quote, Black theater part of the program, but uh, he was really just an amazing professor and um, really encouraged me because uh, I, um, I I had an assignment uh, that I turned in to write a scene or something, and he encouraged me to complete it as a play, which did very well. Um, they put it the the um, put it on at the theater and a couple of other places did the play, but. But Earl was um, just really very, very influential, even now I think about him. And also I think some of the basic uh, tenets that I follow as an actor, um, my, you know, the way I approach uh, my work, it came from um, the, the lessons and training I got from him. And there were other, uh, there was a, a professor named David Regal who was at the University of Detroit, but also uh, taught classes at Wayne State, mm -hmm. um, who was also really, uh, had a big influence on me and, uh, I mean, in a real basic way, because that mm -hmm. was, they saw something in me that I think in the very beginning, I, I didn't see in myself. Right. And, um, well, that's the best and, part of being a professor. Yeah, and they know? allowed me that space to find it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that, yes. uh, yeah. We sort of, we see the seeds and we just, we keep watering it. And sometimes they flourish right in front of our eyes in the span of a semester. And sometimes, you know, we look up and it's been months or years later. And uh, we've just been a part of that growth process 
um, yeah. on the short little yeah. journey, which is the best part of being a professor. It's lovely right. to hear you talk about your professors. Um, okay, we're going to take a quick break. I'm with Mr. Ernie Hudson, and we're playing The Blackest Question. Okay, we are back. I'm with Mr. Ernie Hudson. We're playing The Blackest Questions. Are you ready for question number four? You're doing very well. So. <laughs> okay, you're doing very well. So question number four. Prior to embarking on a successful literary career, this writer, author, and Pulitzer Prize winner first served in the U.S. Coast Guard. Who was he? Um, the U.S. Coast Guard? Um... Um, um, geez. Um, I don't know, Richard Wright? I don't know. Good guess, but it's Alex Haley. Al Alex, of course. Yes. So Haley conducted interviews for Playboy magazine. Um, he elicited candid comments from jazz musicians like Miles Davis about his thoughts and feelings on racism. Um, he appeared in Playboy's September 1962 issue with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s Playboy interview with him, uh, yeah. and it was the longest he ever granted to any publication. Uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X was published in 1965, which was Haley's yeah. first book, and he ghost wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X based on more than 50 in-depth interviews he conducted with Malcolm X between 1963 and Malcolm X's February 1965 assassination. And in 1973, Haley wrote his only screenplay, Superfly, TNT, and the film starred and was directed by Ron O'Neill. In 1976, he published Roots, the saga of an American family, and Roots was eventually published in 37 languages, and he won a special Pulitzer Prize for the work in 1977. And that same year, Roots was adapted as a popular television miniseries of the same name by ABC, and it reached a record-breaking 130 million viewers. And Roots emphasized that Black Americans have a long history, and that not all of that history is necessarily lost, as many had believed. And its popularity also sparked a greatly increased public interest in genealogy. And in 1979, ABC aired the sequel miniseries, Roots, The Next Generations, which continued the story of Kunta Kinte's descendants. And in 2016, there was a, a remake of the original uh, miniseries on the History Channel. So, like Alex Haley, you also enlisted in the U.S. Armed Forces and you were in the, the Marine Corps. In 1979... You appeared in Roots, The Next Generations. What was that experience like? Yeah, um, it's when I first worked with and, and met James Earl Jones. Uh, it was great. I didn't have a lot to do in it, but I was just so happy to be a part of it. Uh, I didn't know that uh, Alex Haley wrote Superfly. And um, what? I, uh, wow, you know, uh, I've always been so just impressed with him and his body of work and you know um but yeah i was just very very honored to to be there you know like i said i didn't do a lot but i was very happy to um to be a part of it mm -hmm. well i mean you mentioned james earl jones in your beginning stages of your career and even uh the middle stages of your career are there any black actors that you you looked up to or that you tried to emulate in any of their, whether it's work ethic or um, their approach to a script or a scene? Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think we actors, we, we, or at least when I came through, we're sort of lone wolves. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't run with a posse normally. You know, I think to survive this business, you kind of have to sort of put your head you know, down and keep moving forward, keep working. At least that's how I thought of it. So you don't really get to know each other well, but you, but you, but there are people. Yeah, James Earl Jones was just as a theatrical, an actor who commanded, who was just, you know, bigger than life. Who I mean, I think as an actor, I wanted to. In fact, I ended up doing the Great White Hope for uh, a number of years, a play that he had done originally on Broadway. So I've always, and to this day, I, I'm just so such a fan of his, an admirer of his, but also Sidney Poitier, and not mm -hmm. because of uh, the acting I, mean, I loved as well, but just as a, the example that he always presented, he projected, you know, his there was something just in, inspiring about 
just him and who he was and how he he how he just carried himself mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um and I, because I think sometimes you know, growing up um, as a, a you know a black kid without a dad, um, you know the family dynamics are uniquely your own. <laughs> because, <laughs> but um, those you know, Sydney Portier and um, you know Blackboard Jungle, and just seeing the possibilities. And sometimes I don't know if it's you know activism is is really admirable and wonderful, but sometimes just the light that you carry. And James Earl Jones, you know, was inspiring on stage and as an actor, but Sidney, uh, just as a human being, I thought, uh, mm-hmm. um, always, you know, and when you see people uh, accomplish things that you sometimes consider impossible, it certainly um, right. lights the way for you to keep pushing forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and just helps you see a foundation that's possible uh, as you move forward. We're going to take a quick break. I am just over the moon talking to Mr. Ernie Hudson. We'll be right back listening to The Blackest Question. Okay, we are back. I'm with Mr. Ernie Hudson. We're about to have question number five. Are you ready, Mr. Hudson? I'm probably not, but I'm I'm ready. (laughs) That's all right. But uh, I mean, listen, we're all learning something. I did not know. I am. Uh, and I'm so thankful because, um, you know, yeah, I, I'm enjoying it very much. So thank you. And I didn't know about, you know, your service to the nation in armed services, nor did I know about uh, Mr. Haley's service to the nation in the armed forces. So, I mean, just, you know, again, as I always say on this podcast, Black History is American History, and we just have so many legends uh past and present. And so I'm, I'm just so glad that you're spending some time with us today. Okay, question number five. In 2022, NAACP Image Award winner in the Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series category was nominated for his role as Davis McLean. He later admitted that his unwillingness to be punctual resulted in his character being written off of the hit TV show, Oz. Who is he? Oh my. Um, is that more actually punctual? Um, um, I have no idea. So we know that you were on the hit television show, Oz. The answer yes. is Method Man. So Method Man told Angela Yee on The Breakfast Club that his time of the series Oz wasn't supposed to be so short, but he said mm-hmm. his laziness is what led to the character's death. So he didn't yell cut <laughs> to the producers, but according to page six, Method Man told the television personality that he had fought hard to be a cast on the show, but that one day he just didn't feel like getting up. And so he didn't think that showing up late would be a big deal, uh, but it was a huge deal to showrunner Tom Fontana. And so Method Man recalled that he was told to show up the next day. And when he did, a new script had been created and his character was killed off. And that was the end of his time on Oz. Now we know now that his career is thriving. He was in The Wire, for those of us who know how much I love The Wire, but he also won an NAACP Image Award for in the Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series category in February, 2022 for his role as Davis McLean in Power Book 2, Ghost, uh, that popular series. And so in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the series Oz followed the lives of several inmates and prison personnel at the fictional Oswald State Correctional Facility. And the majority of the story took place in one experimental block, nicknamed the Emerald City inside the facility. So you were a regular on that show. I have to admit, I tried to watch that show and it was too much for me. <laughs> I, I just could, you know, I'm, I'm more of a comedy type person. You know, I can watch Ghostbusters, but every now and again, there's some scenes where I'm like, okay, I'm a touch scared. So, you know, Oz was well out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> But you, but you like Wyatt, the Wire. Oh, I Which, love, you know, Baltimore is my favorite city. Uh, and yeah. I, I teach urban politics. So right. there's a certain tangible reality about that show mm. that wasn't scary. Whereas right. Oz felt like, I don't know these characters. Yeah. And, and they, they're, they're giving me a little bit of agita. So right. <laughs> tell us about well, your time on Oz. Well, you know, I was the warden and... Mm-hmm. Um, I had worked with Tom Fontana on St. Elsewhere, a, a series that Denzel um, mm-hmm. was one of the regulars on. And uh, so when he uh, came up with Oz, he asked me if, uh, to be a part of it. And I so loved working 
on that show. And I can understand Tom was very, um, you know, he was very adamant about people showing up, being on time. You know, it, we did a lot in a little amount of time and you had to show up prepared, ready to go. And there was no time for that kind of, so I can see how uh, he would have been written off after that short period of time. Um, yeah. But it was a great show. I, I, for me, it was such an amazing cast that Tom would bring in mm -hmm. different directors. Um, Brian Cox, who does a show called Secession, he oh, yeah. he directed a couple of the episodes when I first met him. We just recently finished a movie that I worked on with him. Um, but um, yeah, Oz was... Um, it was a great time, we, you know, to to work in New York. But it was just a great cast of people. A lot of people worked on the show who've gone on to do some wonderful work. And um, it was one of those those series that, unfortunately, we it was the first um, one of the first series for HBO, and we only did um, eight episodes, mm -hmm. which meant you couldn't make any money. <laughs> um, you know, network TV, you do right. possibly twenty two shows, so yeah, it's a good payday, but. But Oz was just a great show to work on. I'm mm -hmm. so, so thankful yeah. to have had that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, you, all of you were so brilliant. The little bit that I saw, all of you were so brilliant. And what's this new movie you've got coming out? We got to have you come back on and tell us all about it. Yeah, well, there uh, during the pandemic, uh, the height of the pandemic, I shot three movies. Um, oh my goodness! And uh, I was just in my yoga pants making banana bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, I took some time. Well, we all took some time out, right. and uh, I thought, well, I might as well use this time. So I dropped probably about thirty five pounds. You know, just kind of. Well, I picked serious. them up for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people did, but I got serious about my diet, and then work happened. Um, I I went to um, uh, to Cayman Islands and shot a movie with uh, Nicholas Cage. Okay. Um, called Retirement Plan that should be coming out. Um, uh, soon and um i uh the movie with brian cox is called the prisoner's daughter with uh, kate beckinsale okay uh okay. we shot in vegas during that time uh it was a wonderful script and hopefully it'll you know uh, but i really feel good about it and um there was a uh, a film coming out next in february first of february and well it's coming out soon um <clears throat> called uh, Champions with Woody Harrelson. Well, he got fired. Marcus, get off the court. That wasn't nice. Nothing but bad news for the Iowa Stallions. What an idiot. But they were all very different and mm -hmm. just a lot of fun to 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 be working, especially during that period when everything was kind of shut down. Yes. So before we go to commercial break, I just want everyone to feel super lazy since Mr. Hudson <laughs> made three films while we were all in our pajamas watching Netflix incessantly. We're going to take a quick break and come back and we're going to play the lightning round with Mr. Ernie Hudson. Okay, Mr. Hudson, before we let you out of here, we've got time for a quick black lightning round. Now, this is no right or wrong answers. You just tell us how you feel about the question, okay? Okay, okay, all right. Your favorite hero, Bruce Lee or Muhammad Ali? Oh, Muhammad Ali. If you had to choose, jazz or the blues? Now the blues. Okay. Best 80s travel sitcom Guilty Pleasure goes to Fantasy Island or The Love Boat? Um, Fantasy Island, I have to say. Okay. Most pesky 1980s family goes to One Day at a Time or Give Me a Break? Um, uh, 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 Give Me a Break. Okay. Yeah. What did Mr. T do when he was with the A-Team? He was, um, what did he do? He was a bodyguard? He was a driver. He drive the I did the show, but I don't know what he did. He was, yes. <laughs> well, driver. he also pitied the fool. <laughs> okay, in the vein of Gil Scott Heron and our celebration of 50 years of hip-hop, do you have a favorite rap song or rap artist? Um, I guess, you know, uh, maybe Sugar Hill Gang and the, okay. that song they came out with, I Still Love. And, That's right. Yeah. And if you had to choose, Different Strokes or Webster? Um, different Strokes. Okay. 
Uh, I want to thank our guest for today's episode, Mr. Ernie Hudson. If you go on his IMDb, the list is long and long and long. I'm so thankful for your body of work. You've been listening to The Blackest Questions. The show is produced by Sasha Armstrong, Akila Shedrick, Jeffrey Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is the director of the Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And please download the Grio app and listen and watch many more great shows. Thanks for listening. 